Good evening. My name is Denise Brophy, and I'm the library manager of Providence Community Library's uh, Wonsuk Library location. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, moderator, friends of the library, and, and attendees to Evaluating a Rhode Island Native Through Today's Lens, Issa Hopkins. Our Zoom event is sponsored by the Friends of Wonsuk Library. Before introducing our moderator, I would like to remind our audience that PCL is comprised of nine neighborhood libraries, making our library system the largest in the state and, in effect, the city's second largest free educational institution after the Providence Public School Department. Libraries play a vital role in the process of lifelong learning as social values and attitudes change. Libraries have an ethical responsibility to support intellectual freedom with an effective provision of information, including pub public forums, such as this one this evening, to assess and test our belief systems. The Freedom of Information Act ensures that all persons have access to information, which again is vital to a democratic society. About the gift card? Now, Given the controversy surrounding Lisa Coppigans today, we are urging as a community to reevaluate this Rhode Island native from a contemporary perspective. I am happy to introduce PCL's president of the Board of Trustees and moderator of our Zoom event, Patricia Robb. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm going to give a little bit of background on Isaac Hopkins uh, and his the circumstances of his commemoration. Um, Isaac Hopkins was born in 1718. He went to sea at the age of 20. He engaged in privateering and the slave trade prior to the revolution. In the 1850s, I'm sorry, the 1750s, he bought 200 acres of land as well as a house uh, on, in what is now the north end of Providence. And actually what is now on what is now Admiral Street, which was named after him. In 1775, he was appointed commander in chief of the new American Navy and served with mixed success uh, until 1777, at which time he retired to his house, served in the Rhode Island General Assembly until 1785. I'm showing two pictures of state houses, uh, one in Providence, one in Newport, because the General Assembly moved from place to place uh, until 1900, when our new um, state house was built. He died in his home in 1802. And after his death, the house was occupied by his descendants for the next 88 years. In 1908, the house and several ac acres surrounding it were given to the city with the stipulation that the dwelling and the house and the land be well, be well maintained, used for patriotic purposes and kept as a park. The house would be primarily used for meetings of the Daughters of the Re American Revolution thereafter, although it was open to visitors upon appointment. Meanwhile, the city had condemned for public purposes the Hopkins family burial ground in 1891, located at the corner of Charles Street uh, and Branch Avenue. All of the graves were relocated to the North Burial Ground plot and plans for a, a park and a monument in honor of the, the Admiral were begun. The seven foot on statue on a 12 foot pedestal was cast by the Gorham Company and placed on the site in 1897. The statue itself was paid for by a descendant of Hopkins and the pedestal was paid for by the city. In 1916, the city 
erected a new primary and grammar school on Charles Street near Branch Avenue. And the next year, the school's name was changed to the Ease Hopkins School. It's worth remembering that throughout this whole time period, although the state's black population remained relatively small and largely segregated, Rhode Island was experiencing a huge influx of immigrants, primarily from Southern and Eastern Europe, and also from French speaking Canada. By 1910, one third of the population in Providence was foreign born. If you count their children with at least one parent born abroad, the, the percentage of immigrants in the city rose to nearly two thirds. Uh, so the old Yankee stock were really beginning to feel like they were being inundated by these newcomers. And most of the newcomers were Catholic with a substantial number of Jewish people as well Many of them were poor, they lived in tenements uh, and they were looked down upon and perhaps even feared uh, by the native born Americans. Uh, they uh, were largely Protestant uh, and many of them were the, the leaders of Providence, both in terms of business, in terms of uh, government uh, and culture. And they felt threatened in what they regarded as their own land. This fear would eventually lead to the immigration restriction legislation in the US Congress in the 1920s. Meanwhile, the old guard began to celebrate those so-called heroes whom they felt were the true Americans and had made the country great and who tended to be their ancestors. And this was a, um, a process that took place in many parts of the country and right here in Providence, in Rhode Island as well. So it's in that context that the house was uh, commemorated uh, in, um, it, to remember Isaac Hopkins. And it's not um, a surprise that it's the daughters of the American Revolution who occupied the house afterwards or that it was the Rhode Island Citizens Historical um, Society that placed the plaque on the house. This is not the same as the Rhode Island Historical Society, I uh, hasten to, to add, uh, or that it was the um, Rhode Island Sons of the Revolution who dedicated a plaque to the Commodore in Hopkins Park in 1919. So it's now a, a century later and much has changed, including social values and norms regarding race and ethnicity. And in this context, it's time to reassess Easy Hopkins, and that's what we intend to do tonight. Um, so I'm now going to um, introduce all four of the uh, panelists and we'll uh, directly on to the next. Uh, Henry Marcia will be speaking first. Uh, he's a retired um, Hopkins middle school teacher and the director of City Sail, which teaches uh, boat building sailing at North Providence High School. Marcus Nevius will be, uh, he is uh, assistant professor of history at URI. He researches and teaches courses on the histories of slave resistance, slave-based economies, and abolition. His recent book, uh, City of Refuge, is about the action and communities of escaped near slave labor camps in the White Swamp of Virginia prior to the Civil War. Ray Rickman, it's hard to narrow down his, uh, his various hats, but among other is co-founder of the Stages of Freedom. Uh, he is a rare book dealer. Um, whom we at PCL know because he's given uh, a number of workshops on rare books in our various libraries. And he's also a leader in the promotion of African-American history. And last, but certainly not least, is Matt Garza, uh, artist in residence at the Easy Hopkins Homestead and Park and the creative director, Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the Top Tapa uh, Dance Company and a founding member of the Glitter Goddess Collective. 
So with no further ado, we'll move directly to Henry. Hello, uh, my name is Henry Wansian. I'm a retired teacher who worked at Isaac Hopkins for more than 20 years. Uh, I, my, my purpose for being here today is to shed some light on uh, Isaac Hopkins record as a uh, Naval officer. Um, I'd just like to add one thing that Patricia- Henry, can you speak a little louder? Yes. I'd like to just add one thing that Patricia said about the schools uh, and statues named in honor of people like Isaac Hopkins and Nathaniel Green and Oliver Hazard Perry. Uh, 1916, we were fighting the First World War. So to encourage and motivate soldiers to go to the front, obviously we had to build up some patriotic fervor. So that's one of the reasons why they named it in honor of a local homeboy who did well during the revolution. Uh, as far as Nathaniel Green and Oliver Hazard Perry, Nathaniel Green also, uh, his school was built in the 1930s between the war period and when the, you know, the fervor of what was gonna happen in the coming of World War II. Uh, also Oliver Hazard Perry historically fought in the War of 1812. Okay, getting uh, to Isaac Hopkins now. I'm gonna focus on his military um, history. And uh, so I'm gonna start off by saying that he started off as a mariner in his early 20s. And he was involved in the French and Indian War better known as the Seven Years' War from the year 1756 to 1763. That's where he actually gained his uh, experience as a naval officer. And he, some of the men he fought alongside of, he would later recruit to serve in his Navy, the Continental Navy during the Revolutionary War. Uh, at this time, he resorted to a practice known as privateering. Privateering means that uh, the country that you serve under gives you license to become a pirate and to loot and steal from enemy ships and to keep some of the, the loot for yourself in payment for your services. Uh, so he resorts to privateering and uh, after this period ends, he returns back to Rhode Island, okay? And he serves for the General Assembly from uh, 1764 to roughly 1775 at the beginning of the Revolutionary War. At the very beginning of the war, in October of that year, he's appointed by uh, members of the General Assembly to be a Brigadier General, whose role is to uh, protect the uh, colonial interests of the state of Rhode Island uh, from attacks from the British. Uh, in December of that year, he is appointed the first uh, Admiral of the Continental Navy. His actual title was Commander-in-Chief, uh, equivalent in rank to George Washington. Uh, and in December uh, 5th of that year, uh, I'm sorry, December 25th of that year, 20, uh, 21st of that year, he, uh, he is uh, assigned this position. Then on January 5th, he sails down to Philadelphia to get his orders. Here he is given eight ships to command uh, to uh, take on the mighty British Navy that has 270 ships. Uh, the ships he has are basically merchant ships that are converted for war use with six pounder cannons, that meaning the weight of the cannonball, which was not powerful enough to sink a British warship, it would just put holes in the sails to slow them down. So he's, to he's told at this time by the uh, commission of the Continental Navy, I mean the Continental Congress, to um, take on, uh, he these are his orders. He is to sail down to the Chesapeake Bay area, scout out the strength of the enemy. Um, if uh, weather permits, to uh, attack and destroy the enemy fleet in uh, what would be Virginia, and then from there proceed down to the Carolinas and do likewise. And if that uh, didn't work out because of conditions, to use his own discretion. So what he does is on February 17th, he sails down to that portion uh, of our country and uh, he encounters heavy seas and it's dark, it's nighttime and some of his main men are sick. So he decides he, uh, he can't determine the strength of the enemy force. So he continues to sail further south to, uh, to the Bahamas. There he's had some spies who basically told him that there's a fort, a Fort Nassau, that's not well defended. And it's an easy prize. And there's a lot of munitions there that would definitely be needed by our fighting forces. We were always short of ammunition and supplies. So he decides not to challenge the fleet, the British fleet, who's uh, 
commanded by uh, the royal governor, Lord Dunmore, and he's done a lot of damage to uh, the commercial interests of many delegates of the Continental Congress, especially the Southern delegates. So he pursues uh, going down to Nassau, takes over the fort. On March 17th, he launches an amphibious attack using US Marines. The first time US Marines have been used for this purpose. He easily takes over the fort and seizes the prizes of war, which include 88 cannons, 11,000 rounds of ammunition, 55,000 cannonballs and, and 15 barrels of gunpowder. And so he proceeds from there and sails back to Rhode Island. En route near Long Island, he encounters two British uh, transport ships, the Hawk and the Bolton, and he manages to attack and seize them. So now he's got all this heavy cargo of munitions and he's got two British ships in tow and he's heading back to Rhode Island. And when he gets as far as Block Island, he encounters another British warship, a dispatch ship named the Glasgow. This is a heavily armed ship and it's capable of sinking all of the, his little fleet of eight uh, merchant ships, but he takes them on and they wage battle for three hours in heavy seas. They can't get a, a clear shot because of the heavy seas and it's nighttime. So what he does, uh, he attacks, but he decides to break off the engagement because his own son, John Hopkins is badly wounded and so are some of his other men and he decides to break off the engagement and head towards the Port of Providence. His men are a little upset by this. They say, well, why don't we pursue him? Let's finish him off. Uh, and he says, no. And they say, why? Well, because head, he's heading to Newport and there's 60 British warships waiting to, to take us on. It's a suicide mission. We'll get him on another day. So now he comes to the Port of Providence and when news is, breaks out about this, he's declared a hero. They have poems and kids singing songs and. John Hancock eventually meets up with him and congratulates him personally and says, you know, it's okay if you didn't get the glass cow, you get him on another occasion. Well, the fortunes of war changed for Hopkins at this point because of our lovely government of the time, the Continental Congress. What do they decide to do? It's very difficult to recruit sailors at this time because the uh, conditions at sea were, were miserable. The pay was lousy, the food was lousy. The working conditions were very dangerous. So it was hard to recruit sailors. So they resorted to going back to privateering. And Hopkins didn't like this idea. In fact, he wanted to give up his commission. He said, well, what's the point? How am I gonna get my men to fight? You know, uh, if you're gonna recruit uh, people to be privateers. And incidentally, they gave out 2000 licenses for privateers. So he's, he's, you know, he's really flabbergasted by all this. And he says, you know, I'm against this. And they, and they say to him, well, why are you against it? You were a privateer in the French and Indian War. And he said, because this is a different war. Back then we were owned by England. We were fighting, we were doing their bidding. Now we're fighting for the cause of our country's freedom. Men should fight for the love of their country and not for financial gain. That was a strike against them by the Continental Congress because of their commercial interest. Most of them were businessmen, okay. So then what happens is there's a plague that breaks out, smallpox plague. So now it's even more difficult to recruit sailors because no one wants aboard his ships. To make matters worse, two of his sailors, officers aboard his ship decide to go against them because they're interested in privateering. So they approach members of the Continental Congress and they start saying that he should be relieved of command. First of all, uh, he's incompetent. Secondly, he uses profane language against members of the Continental Congress, suggesting that they're incompetent uh, and just a bunch of uh, you know, bu bureaucratic lawyers. Uh, they don't know anything about warfare. Uh, supposedly, they also go on to say that he mistreats the British prisoners of war, that he's cowardly because he didn't finish off the Glasgow, and he allowed another British ship, the Diamond, to escape that ran aground. Well, at this censorship hearing, uh, what happens is he's defended by the likes of Ben Franklin, John Adams, the great naval hero, John Paul Jones, and William Henry Lee, the father of Robert E. Lee, like, better known as Light Horse Harry Lee. So what happens? They listen to all this and he's basically cleared of the charges, but the Continental Congress goes against them because of the, their vested interest in commercial uh, commercialism. They're all in the in trade, involved in trade. 
and the southern delegation gave him the first shot against them, which was they, that he didn't protect their interest in the Chesapeake Bay area and in the Carolinas. So what happens is after much ado, they uh, decide uh, to um, relieve him of command. And at his censure hearing, they ask him, do you have any last words to say? Now I'm gonna read his exact words and then I'll explain what he meant by this. One thing I can say, and with truth, that I still am determined not to quit the cause, but whenever you or the Congress think you can get a man in my place that will be of more service to the cause, you may have my leave, and in justice to the country, I think you ought to do it. As for me, I love this, I shall continue to do what good I can in a less envied and troublesome way. So basically what he's saying is, if you think you can find a better man to lead this Navy, by all means do so, we need good leaders. As for me, I will continue fighting for the cause of my country's freedom, but I'll do so in a less troublesome and envied way. So he's basically sticking it back to the members of the Continental Congress. These are all businessmen with commercial interests. Here's a man who's giving his life and he's putting it on the line for his country. And unfortunately, he was not respected. He was basically the Rodney Dangerfield of his day. He wasn't respected then, didn't receive the recognition that he deserved. And, you know, it's up to history today to decide where his place is. Uh, and his command was very short lived. Uh, it was from 1775 to 1777. And after he left the Navy, he continued to work for the General Assembly. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Uh, we're moving on to Marcus now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you first for uh, and uh, joining us this evening for this wonderful conversation. I'm going to do what most historians can never do well, and that is uh, present my portion very briefly. It is my opportunity this evening to talk about the context of slavery that is paramount to understanding Isaac Hopkins' world and to considering his legacy. That history is ancient as much as it was a part of his world. It traced to the ancient world. Many of you may know of the way in which slavery had its roots in bib bib biblical times, had its roots in ancient times as well. More closer to Isaac Hopkins' world, is the fact that the transatlantic context for slavery traced to the mid 1440s to the first efforts of Portuguese merchants uh, and others explorers to engage with African polities along the West African coast near what is considered to be Senegambia today. Where does Rhode Island fit in this conversation? Of course, Rhode Island was established in the 17th century in uh, England's effort to establish colonies, a string of them, up and down the North American Atlantic coast in that century. What this means and what it's very important for us to consider is that the world in which Rhode Island was created was a world in which slavery was ever present. In this context, Native American people were enslaved as is well known or is becoming more widely known today in the 17th century. There are several books which I can mention elsewhere, uh, which are recent and good histories for us to consider. That as people of African descent began to arrive in Rhode Island in the 17th century, they too were drawn into uh, that colony in a context of slavery many of whom having been transported across the Atlantic Ocean uh, as enslaved people, chattels, uh, considered to be private property by those who transported them by force across the Atlantic Ocean. And indeed, after 1700, Great Britain's empire became the center of transatlantic slave trading. Its merchants in its colonies and in its metropole were vital to uh, financing the transatlantic slave trade to developing its networks all throughout the Atlantic world and beyond. And essentially this meant that slavery 
was very much a network of wealth along the same context as other trade goods, including gold and others that we may consider in this context. To put it another way, Isaac Hopkins' birth in 1718 was a birth into a world that was defined in no uncertain part by slavery. His uh, rise as a, a continental or a colonial uh, in the Seven Years' War would have been in a world where slavery was omnipresent, where it was everywhere. His efforts to engage in the American Revolution would have unfolded in a context of slavery and also in a context of significant change as slavery itself at the mid 18th century uh, became increasingly criticized by small pockets of people who began to develop a conscience about this terrible commerce in human beings. So as we're considering this evening, Isaac Hopkins legacy, it is very important that we consider framing his world as a world in which slavery was central. It was not a bit piece of his world, but central. And indeed, it is important for us to consider too, more broadly, Rhode Island's history uh, in this world and Rhode Island's uh, place really as a center of transatlantic slave trading or at a minimum, the financing of transatlantic slave trading. And again, there are plenty of histories that are coming out uh, in the, the uh, last decade or so, which are excellent studies of this. Uh, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Uh, Marcus? I have, Marcus, I have a question. Uh, Isaac Hopkins, I know, was involved in the slave trade working for Nicholas and Moses Brown in uh, right after the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, uh, aboard a slave ship known as the Sally. Uh, and I know that he didn't have any experience as a slaver in terms of being captain of such a ship and that this uh, mission was horrendous. Uh, of 196 slaves, 109 died. But my understanding was that after that horrible event, uh, he basically said, I'm through with this. I don't want any part of this uh, institution. Uh, do you have any facts beyond, beyond that? I, because uh, my research is rather fuzzy on whether or not he continued to ply in, this, in the slave trade. I know his brother Stephen was kicked out of the, uh, being a Quaker because he owned slaves and he refused to give, uh, to give up the practice. I think before uh, Marcus is that question, why don't we let Ray go first, because I believe he's going to talk about some of these issues. So on uh, September 11th, 1764, uh, from Fox Point, Aesop Hopkins uh, captained a ship, the Sally, which is what we were just talking about. And off he went to Africa as slave captain. Uh, I have uh, studied him, looked at him um, for probably 30 years. And I can find virtually no redeeming factors. Mm -hmm. You know how people like to say, uh, you know, other than Hitler, they see something good in everyone. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure what good I can see in Mr. Hopkins. Uh, he was supposed to be a rude, uh, vulgar human being. Uh, his, uh, the sailors involved with him and his officers uh, didn't like him at all. George Washington could not stand him. Now, how did he get to be Admiral of the uh, Navy? For one year, for a year and 18 months, 18 months, I believe. He got it because his brother Stephen, signer of the Declaration of Independence, was 10 times governor of Rhode Island, chief of the Supreme Court, co-founder, provost of Brown University, and I'm just getting started. <laughs> he was also the financier of the American Revolution. 
That is, he raised money for George Washington. And this is a classic Rhode Island nepotism story, classic. Uh, Stephen Hopkins went to George Washington <clears throat> during one of Washington's visits here and says, my brother needs a job. <laughs> and I'm on the uh, Create the Navy uh, Commission and I'd like you to make him Admiral. And Washington kind of said no. And then finally he said, yes, what else could he do? And he was sorry very soon that he'd said yes. Now, uh, some folks like to be kind, but um, He's accused of everything, of, uh, of not doing very good in warfare, of not protecting the middle states, of favoring Rhode Island every chance he got, of taking, uh, of doing a little pirateering himself during his time as Admiral of the Navy. And he was kicked, it, he was relieved, <laughs> brutally relieved of being Admiral, first Admiral of the United States. Now, if he'd been a great admiral, we'd have something very interesting to talk about that, you know, he's a great admiral and that's what he's being honored for, but he was a lousy admiral and he was a pirate and he was a slaver and he was, and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, what happened, and this, this was uh, uh, told to you in the beginning, uh, about 1870, the Anglo-Saxon uh, English community decided that too many foreigners around here in this nation, and they better remind us all of the English founding of this nation and of the pilgrims and everything else. And so for about 40, 50 years, every Anglo-Saxon who'd done anything of interest or that we could create stories about was put on a pedestal. <laughs> and that that's People do that uh, and they do it in all, and I'm not picking on Anglo-Saxons because other folks do it. When you have a clout, you remember the past you want to remember. Now, let me give you an example of something because I find Americans to be the most unbelievable people. Uh, I was thinking the other day when the United States senators were hiding in the basement of the Senate office building, the Russell office building, hoping not to be killed by people who are involved in sedition, uh, trying to bring the nation down or at least disrupt it. They were hiding in the basement of the Russell Senate office building. Mr. Russell of Georgia was the most famous racist ever to serve in the United States Senate and died, I believe, in 1971. And there they were in this building. You listening? doesn't matter how sick a human being are, you can be honored in the public square. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with Mr. Hopkins. He's honored in the public square. And I believe when you are lucky enough to fall into something, <laughs> and not even for yourself, but because the basically the Anglo-Saxon community is trying to elevate the English underpinnings of this nation, and he was a good tool to use. I believe his time has come and gone. For more than a hundred years, he has been publicly honored. I had someone say to me what I know to be true, that they are shocked that he was a slave captain. No one in that school ever told them. This is a young man told me that. He was flabbergasted and floored that he went to that school for years with a slave captain's name on the wall. And it's disgraceful. And he asked me, what is Stages of Freedom going to do about it? And I said, we're going to move to have Mr. Hopkins name removed. We're going to ask the city council to do that in a formal petition. Why? Because we should not in this day and age, have to live in the shadow of racism. Slave captains are racist. <laughs> Most of the people in society at that time, and I, I'm going to wrap up with this. You have things that people do and believe, and then it changes. When I was a child going to the South every summer for eight or nine years, it was unbelievable how we were treated and what people said and what they called us. 
I was in the South about three years ago and I was shocked. I didn't want to go to the South. I hadn't been there in 30 years, but I was begged by my two sisters to go with them on a trip. And I went and we were there five days and no one called me the N word to my face. When we were kids, if you could go 20 minutes without being called that in a store or on the street, it was a, a, an accomplishment. The nation needs to evolve. It needs to change. Every single human being needs to say all the symbols of racism need to be brought down. Final comment on this. Uh, Mr. Hopkins had a slave boy and he had the audacity to take him on the Sally. Edward Abbey, he took him on the Sally as a child with all that debt. We would like to take Mr. Hopkins off of his statue, off of his uh, platform. Platform belongs to the city, by the way. <laughs> like to take him off and it would be the first time in the history of America, as far as we know, that a regular slave child is elevated. We know his name. We know that he became a sailor. We would elevate him and we can see African African-Americans in an exalted position in this city. Now that's what we'd like to do because again, someone's gonna dispute me. Yeah, you see black slaves kneeling before Lincoln but you don't see them standing up straight. And I'd like everybody uh, to do this. Now finally on, on uh, statues, on, uh, Mr. Um, Hopkins statue is probably worth something. And I hope an auction house or Naval Society or group or someone who believes that his admiralty was worth noting to buy it and give the money to the city of Providence to help with the new statue. So that stages of freedom doesn't have to raise the money. Thank you, Ray. I think we'll move straight on to Matt, uh, the last of our speakers before we move into uh, more of a discussion. Thank you, Patricia. Um, could I get screen share enabled, please? Thank you so much. All right, so to kick off, I'd love to invite everyone to take three breaths with me. You can close your eyes if you want, you can leave them open. If you wanna roll your shoulders back a few times, we've been listening. First, I'll invite us to take a breath of gratitude for whatever comes to mind. Breathing in and out. A breath for all the ancestors we bring to this moment. May we learn from their stories told and untold. Breathing in and out. And finally, a breath for the intentions and well being of everyone with us in this virtual space and those from the future who are viewing this archive. Breathing in and out. Thank you. Before I introduce myself, I first wanna name that women's voices are missing from this panel. I want to honor my grandparents, Agosta Vera Garcia, artist and healer, Jose Garcia, educator and activist, Remigio Garza, earth worker, healer and community organizer, and Ramona Figueroa Garza, artist, educator and healer. I also want to honor my indigenous and Tejano ancestors of the US Mexican border who imagined my existence and fought against colonization again and again and again and again. 
I want to acknowledge that my work, our work, is in lineage with Seydou Koulibaly, Michel Bak Koulibaly, and Sekou Kamara of the Yeridon Center in Jumanzana, Mali, with April Brown and Kai Cameron of the Langston Hughes Community Poetry Reading, with Andrali Horn of Open Farms and Joe Ayuso of Movement Education Outdoors and Martin Rivera Baldera. I'd also like to acknowledge all of our queer femme BIPOC ancestors who have fought for change so that we can be having this conversation. None of us would be in this work together without their courage, wisdom, and magic. I am Matthew Garza, son of Rolando and Nelda Garza of Alice, Texas and San Diego, Texas. By training, I'm a dancer, choreographer, multidisciplinary performance artist, historian, and educator who works at the intersection of historical intervention, cultural preservation, liberation pedagogy, and decolonization practice. Today, I am here representing my family, my fiance, Anthony, A.M. Andrade of Cape Cabo Verde and West Africa, and my godbrother, whose government name is Trent, but prefers to go by his artist name, Trash, of West Africa and the local Narragansett people. For just over a year, the three of us have been living in the former home of Isa Hopkins, thanks to the groundbreaking two-year Parkist Artist Residency with the Providence Parks Department, the Providence Department of Art, Culture, and Tourism. That's right, the city is our landlord. I am also here representing the House of Glitter Dance Company and Performance Lab, part of the Glitter Goddess Collective, a community of artists, performers, educators, therapists, counselors, and healers dedicated to exploring the intersections of learning, play, liberation, and social, emotional, and spiritual growth. The House of Glitter Dance Company is choreographing for the collective human body. We work through movement to shift the energetic center of the universe towards liberation. Finally, I am here representing the brilliant and ferocious young artists at Trinity Academy for the Performing Arts, a radical community of learning that disrupts the school to prison pipeline by working in community-centered creative practice. During our first year in residency here in the park, we have been living and breathing and creating around studies of the legacy of Isa Hopkins, whose home was built 256 years ago to engage in the beginnings of what we hope to be at least 256 years of patriotic restoration, transformation, and liberation. You can read more about our first year in the park at thehouseofglitter.org. We are proud to say that in our first year of residency, we did not colonize, murder, torture, or enslave a single US American citizen. And we were able to peacefully negotiate all disagreements to avoid any warfare, battles, or physical violence. Here at the House of Glitter Performance Lab, we have learned so, so, so much from the history preserved around the legacy of Isaac Hopkins and are proud to be surpassing his numerous accomplishments with fewer casualties and crime in every category. Marking a bittersweet ending to this chapter of Issa Kopkin's story, our work is a disruption of the historical archives to make it known in time and space that there are stories missing from the picture we've painted of Issa Kopkin's, to remember that our daily lives are history in the making, to imagine what could be. We spent our first year studying the archives and history books, learning from our elders, connecting with earth and ancestral wisdom, getting to know our neighbors and holding space for dialogue, community building and creative healing practice. We learned that we could even read the letters he wrote to the Brown brothers of Brown University from the first voyage of the slave ship Sally in the digital archives of Brown University. Deep in our research, however, we found no stories about the indigenous people who previously lived with the earth space we now call the Isa Hopkins Homestead and Park. And we found even fewer stories about the enslaved people who were so intimately integral to his legacy. We realized that the historical research we had been engaging in did not represent all of the people in the story and that the glorification of Isa Hopkins legacy instead represents a fantasy. So we decided that we would turn to our own imaginations to create a fantasy of our own, 
a piece of art that tells our story as well as how our ancestors' stories intersect with the legacy of Isaac Hopkins. After all, we might be the most legendary historical event to take place in the homestead since Isaac Hopkins passed. Our project, The Historical Fantasies of Isaac Hopkins, will be the culmination of our two years in the Isaac Hopkins homestead and park. In addition to sharing the stories, cultures, and creative magic of the House of Glitter's Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Laotian ancestors, this project shares a fantasy that we have created to imagine the missing stories from the legacy of Isaac Hopkins, to imagine what life would be like today if colonization or slavery never happened, to rehearse for a world that centers healing, care, and community. In fact, even though we spent so much time reading and hearing his name, the story we couldn't stop thinking about was the story of the woman who hung herself on the first voyage of the slave ship, Sally. Inspired by our research with one of our collaborators, local artist, Jarrett Key, whose work is pictured here, we decided to ask ourselves, what if we imagine just one single black person as a fully realized human with a story, a family and emotions, someone who could scream, cry and shout. You see, all we know about her from our research thus far is that she was identified to be a woman, that she was black, and that she was recorded to have hung herself on the first voyage of the slave ship Sally. Once we started to begin this process of empathizing with one single person, we realized that we knew so much more than that. We also knew where Issa Hopkins sailed to. So we can believe that she was from West Africa. We can believe that she was probably going about her business, maybe going to school, praying, farming, selling handmade goods in the market, singing, dancing, or taking care of her family, as our studies of West African people during that time were known to do. We can believe that she was brought to a castle on the Cape Coast, kidnapped by indentured servants from neighboring villages, we can believe that she was separated from her family forever, tortured, beaten, and starved in a single white stone room where we can still see the red blood stains lining the space today. We can believe that most of the people in that room died, surrounded by urine, fecal matter, vomit, afterbirth, blood, and menstruation. We also know that she survived that room. We know that she was put on the slave ship Sally, we know that she is remembered as an individual in the archives. And we know this because she is listed on the inventory, inventory list next to bottles of rum and rope. Unlike those on Sally who died from the known torture of those voyages, those who jumped off ship and those who fought for their freedom only to be murdered, suppressed with violence, this woman hung herself alone or perhaps with help. By nature of this choice, Isa Hopkins and his men had to carry her body as an individual. They had to deliberately throw her individual human body into the Atlantic Ocean. Did they look her in the eyes too? Even still, we found ourselves searching for missing pieces of the story. The archives were not enough to do justice to this one woman. So we have imagined and created the historical fantasy of Isa Hopkins a multimedia dance concert, album, film, curriculum, coloring book, graphic novel, and community demonstration. The historical fantasy of Issa Hopkins begins with the story of this woman, her life and the legacy that she birthed on the first voyage of the slave ship Sally. We believe her story of strength and power to be an inspiration. And after sharing a preview of the first scene this past October, we cannot wait to share the first full performance of the work with our friends, family, and community this summer, 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I hope you're going to invite us all. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, We've heard now uh, from all four panelists, uh, we've heard some strongly held uh, but con conflicting positions tonight. Um, I'd like us to think about some of the broader issues that are related to this debate uh, before we have questions from the audience. And by the way, audience, if you have questions that you want to ask the panelists, this would be a good time to write them in the chat box. I'd like to ask Matt the first question. I'm sorry, Marcus, the first question. Uh, what does it say about us as Rhode Islanders if we do or we don't change the name of the school and the house and take down the statue? 
you for that question, Patricia. I'll answer it very briefly and hopefully very concisely. It would say that we as Rhode Islanders are not attending the changing times, that we are not attending the deep-seated uh, hurt that seeing someone who engaged in slavery in this way uh, inflicted, even if not directly. And it would say that we as Rhode Islanders are complicit, directly or indirectly, in maintaining a legacy that needs to change. I think it would be fair that the school's name changes. And I think it would be fair in so doing that it's not just simply a, a pro forma signature that uh, approves the name of the, the, the name change, but that also it is involved and that it brings to bear uh, fora for the community to learn just why this name change is so very important. Thank you. H Henry, do you wanna answer the same question? Uh, well, I tend to agree. Um, it's about time we bring about change, change for the better. Can you speak a little louder again? Uh, it's about time we bring about change for the better, and I do agree. Um, the legacy of the time period in which Isaac Hopkins lived is long past, okay? We have reached a new vision of this country, and we have to incorporate all groups and, and recognize their accomplishments and contributions to this nation. The only thing I would take exception to one, a couple of things that Ray said. First of all, uh, as a teacher at Hopkins, we had a plaque that has been taken down by other administrators. They clearly pointed out that he was involved in the slave trade and we condemned it, but we wanted to give a historical record of what he did. And also in terms of his use of profanity against the Continental Congress, I may add, and his incompetence as a commander, that George Washington was also considered incompetent. He lost most of the battles he fought against the British. And in fact, um, Benedict Arnold, until he gave up becoming loyal to his country, was considered a better commander. And he also used profane language against the Continental Congress. And I just wanna explain why they did. First of all, they constantly petitioned the Continental Contra Congress for supplies, ammunition, food, payment for their service, and the, 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 the message fell on deaf ears. So I can, I can kind of like relate to their frustrations. They must've said a lot of nasty things, but who knows what the Continental Congress had to say about them as well. So I just wanted to clear that point. And incidentally, Rhode Island was always bad back in those days. It was referred to as Rogue's Island, okay? A, a, a pirate den. Thank you. Uh, Ray, you want to uh, say something here? No. Um, yeah, on, on a very technical level, uh, Stages of Freedom uh, can give anyone who wants uh, digital uh, links uh, to uh, some of the information and, and to Hopkins letters and the like, mm -hmm. particularly to the Brown brothers. And they just go to stages of freedom at aol.com. Uh, I, I think I said clearly, but let me say it again. We have been mis, we have been abused as children, as uh, citizens, by an educational system that has failed to tell us the truth about slavery, about Mr. Hopkins, about a whole lot of things. Uh, I was thrilled last year. Uh, involved and thrilled in us ridding our state name of plantations. You know, people quit telling lies about what it meant and a majority of the people helped to clean our name and maybe our soul a little bit. So um, th th that's what I, I, I would point out. We really, uh, again, I may not have another chance, so let me say this. Uh, Cominger, who was the most famous um, writer of, of uh, textbooks, uh, his textbook uh, for seventh, eighth graders was used for 40 years by 80% of all school children in America until 1971 or two. 
and he handled slavery with 10 lines, 10 lines. So you have a lot of historians, a lot of educators doing us, the people, a disservice. Thank you. And Matt, let's move to a new question for you. Um, I think your, what your project is doing is not exactly erasing um, Isaac Hopkins, but kind of redefining him and, and his impact. What impact would actual erasure have? Uh, would erase the memory of, of Hopkins and his time, do you think? Yeah, I think that's a, a really important distinction. I don't think that it would, I think it'd be horrific to try to erase it, to erase any parts of our past, um, it, it would be horrific. Um, and it's, it's not even that we're trying to reframe Isaac Hopkins legacy, we're just trying to continue writing. Um, and that's really what it is for me. I don't want to continue to make photocopies of decade after decade. Um, I want, I believe that our, that if we make space for the wisdom of, of everybody in a community, um, and that's to me what a school should be, a practice of how to belong together and how to innovate on belonging together, um, then we can, and the, the idea of just paying attention to, to the titles of buildings is such a superficial uh, discussion, you know, how can we go deeper into what books are children reading and how are they being treated and what behaviors are acceptable and deemed unacceptable in a space together and how are we relating to each other. So um, I do think it'd be horrific to try to erase history. I'd like to keep on writing together um, and I'd, I'd like to make sure everyone has a pencil um, and I'd like to make sure that everybody feels safe and feels um, like they're in a that they're not in a moment of trauma, they're not experiencing trauma so that they can even access their voice to write. Um, so yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you. Does anybody else uh, want to weigh in on this question? Uh, yes, because, um, so I told somebody we're examining, Stages of Freedom is examining if Stephen Hopkins' name should be taken off of Stephen Hopkins' little street next to the Supreme Court in Providence. And the chair of our board, I told her that a, a public official, I won't say who yet, uh, um, pushed back and said, he's a signer of the Declaration of Independence. You can't take his name off the street. And she said something to me so brilliant. She said, uh, this is just a drop in the water. That's all. His name is on the Declaration of Independence and it will never be taken off. He has his standing. You know, we're doing so little. We're just not honoring him in the Providence public square. That's all. We don't have the power to erase Stephen Hopkins from history. I'm not sure we should, right. but I am telling you that uh, in Providence, having the street named after you is honorific. It says we appreciate you and we have elevated you to a special status. Same thing with Mr. Hopkins. Uh, he's first admiral. I, I read uh, something, I read uh, the Naval uh, Association's write-up of him in Washington DC this morning. And I was shocked how sweet it was. <laughs> we can't erase uh, Admiral Hopkins. We cannot. Thank you. Last question, and then we'll move to the questions from the audience. We have about 10 more minutes. Um, who decides whether whose history is, is worth preserving? And specifically in this case, who's going to decide, who should decide uh, what should happen with the Hopkins name? As you know, it, the uh, Providence, um, School board has recommended to the city council that uh, the name be changed. The city council is considering it and it's gone out to one of the committees. Uh, as they make their decision, um, what should they be considering? Who should they should be asking? Anybody? Can I tell you that uh, rules are rules and if you don't like rules, you have them changed. 
and the power to uh, do these things rest in the Providence City Council. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 1916, the existing Providence City Council, without thought or with thought, uh, wasn't there. <laughs> they named that school after Hopkins, that's their power. And now in 2021, the city council has that same power. So I, I, you know, I hear this from people that they want a new system so they can have a new outcome. Uh, this is a legislative matter before the city council of Providence. My thought is they will do this, but if they didn't, it's their power not to. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Uh, it, should the city council be considering anyone else? I mean, who should be making a, a decision on the sort of on the street as opposed to uh, formally? Patricia, if I may, I'll uh, I'll jump in here uh, because Ray is correct. It is it is a legislative matter in in that regard, but the Providence City Council should also be paying close attention. Should be attending well its community. Uh, and to some degree, it's, it's our charge as well uh, to be sure that we're acknowledging that the community's input is what should guide this decision. And here's why, at least in my opinion, communities change. Uh, Providence's community changed as you noticed or as you observed in your introduction uh, to our conversation this evening. It's in part the shifting demographics of Providence which informed they who sat down in the Providence City Council 100 years ago to decide to raise Isaac Hopkins as, as a symbol of the United States and its past and Rhode Island's place in that past. But that community has since changed. And Providence is not alone uh, in being an urban center in this nation that witnessed such significant demographic shifts in the 20th century. Uh, and, and so that should be very much taken into account. Uh, and those legislators who sit on that council should be attending very well the community's will. I believe and actually I've had... that is happening. I know that um, Councilman Ducci, right. who is uh, the councilman for Ward uh, 4, which is where uh, Easy Hopkins' is various uh, statue house and school are located, has said publicly that he feels that the community should have a, a major voice uh, in, in what happens here. Um, so can I point out to you what you already know, that there is petition uh, put together by a fabulous 19 year old, a former student of that school in which he's gotten several thousand people to sign. So that is the community speaking. Uh, and, and then I go back to, and I want to be careful that we don't uh, pen, pen this just on race. If you uh, were to look at the citizens of Providence, you know, the east side, which is 92 or 3% white. If you took a poll on College Hill and uh, Summit and Blackstone Boulevard, 95% of the white people would say that uh, Mr. Hopkins' name should come off the school. It's a different time in which people have uh, been forced to or willing to think about uh, negative things we have put in our public spaces. So, you know, I, I would add that we, we do change uh, on, in regards to, you know, women's rights and black rights and gay rights and, and you know, on and on and on. We're a better nation when it comes to looking at these um, problems, uh, if I may. Okay, L last comment and then we'll go to the questions. I, I'd like to just make this comment. Uh, I agree with what the rest of the panel has said. However, from a historical pan standpoint, I think we need to add to the story, not take away from the story, correct the portions that are inaccurate and were left out. But we have to remember at the time that Hopkins fought for this country, this country wasn't free, it was owned by England. So before any of us could get our rights and freedoms, someone had to fight to gain those rights and freedoms. 
Okay, so history is basically evolutionary when it comes to justice and rights. Uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War, the, uh, the, the prior to the Revolutionary War, the landed gentry were the ones who could vote and control the society. And after the Revolutionary War, those same people did, they wanted to deny the soldiers who fought in that war the right to the vote. I mean, women didn't have any rights, slaves didn't have any rights, Native Americans didn't have any rights. So it was an evolutionary process. And I do believe that we need to add to the story and correct the errors. And I do also agree that the time has come for change. The population of the city has changed and it should be in the community involvement in deciding what should be done. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Janet, I believe Janet, who is a member of the uh, Wanskuk Friends Group, is going to um, read some of the questions that have been posed uh, for the panelists. Good evening. Uh, one of the viewers has written, how can we involve the youth in community so they learn the real history and so they can get involved in a renaming and redefinition process? so as to honor the black community and their ancestors. And I would love to know Matt and Ray's ideas on this. Why don't we ask for uh, Matt first since Ray's spoken recently. Thank you. Um, I of course echo what's been said about involving the community in decisions when possible. And I also think that as Ray mentioned, we can also change rules and systems um, with the times. I think that, it, that it's, it's um, reasonable to have a rule in place um, that if someone is a mass murderer, um, that we can just remove the name and we can even have an interim name. When you fire someone in a position of power, there's an interim person in place. So I feel, I, I can't help but also feel like moving things to committee and and drawing out a process of making a decision as a community, I think there should also just be a system in place where, whereby we have an ethical and moral um, bottom line. So I, I think that, that it's possible to both remove a name and engage the community forever in renaming and renaming and renaming our spaces um, to be empowering for everyone. And of course, I'm a big believer that Young people and educators should build should build curriculum together, and the curriculum should be built by communities, and it should be an ongoing process of revision and revision, um, and inclusion and inclusion. So I think that there are so many amazing organizations in Providence that do youth-centered and youth-led work that our city could turn to to explore an analysis of the names of every school and every building in Providence and that that should be a part of the work of schools as, innov as innovators on being belonging together. Thanks, Matt. Ray, you may have already answered this question. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, this is youth-led the changing of the name. And it's absolutely fabulous that the 19 year old got out ahead of everybody else. Uh, I've actually thought, I wrote a letter to the first lady of the United States, former first lady, Mrs. Obama, uh, when they were talking about putting a woman's uh, image on one piece of currency. I suggested that uh, there be a program to put women on 50% of the currency. It'd have to be a, probably a 20 year process. I also suggested that everybody on the currency, maybe every 25 years, we vote whether they should stay because they're new voices, new people. I'd like to see Maya Angelou on the dollar bill. I really would, I'm not pulling your leg. And this idea that everybody has to be a white man dead for 200 years is an absurdity. Uh, Stages of Freedom believes that you have to involve everybody in decision-making and particularly find a way to bring young people in. So I, I'm just thrilled with the question, but we need new systems to make a new world. We really do. Okay, thanks. Um, Janet, next question. Now, another question is um, from the current principal at Isakakian School. The question is, do you think our students identify with Isaac Hopkins and feel pride in his history? Does his name bring a notion and feeling of community? Uh, let's see. That's his question. 
and he wants it to all panelists. Okay, Marcus, what about that? That's a very interesting question to which I think the short answer is yes, and here's why. I'm not a native of Providence, nor am I a native of Rhode Island. I am a native of a community, New Brunswick, New Jersey, where recently the schools have had their names changed. One of the first of those schools was a school named Nathan Hale, of course, for uh, a person in history who at the time that the community named that school such reflected what the administrators and others in that community wanted the children to think when they went to that school. Just before I entered that school in kindergarten, its name was changed. It was at a time when New Brunswick and Rutgers University was celebrating Paul Robeson, the uh, early 20th century black person, one of the first black people to graduate from Rutgers University among all the other things that he wound up doing in the 20th century. It became known as Paul Robeson Community School. And in part that name change was to reflect the demographic change in the neighborhood that it served, which had shifted from a previous uh, neighborhood largely populated by white people who identified with Nathan Hale to increasingly black families who increasingly identified with Paul Robeson. It is in part because I attended Paul Robeson Community School that I became uh, aware of Paul Robeson's place in history uh, as a black person and as an American. And I think that if, if that example is of any circumstance, it's important to consider as you consider uh, the children that Isaac Hopkins now serves. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll move on to one last question um, since we don't have too much time left. Um. This person is asking, wasn't Stephen Hopkins one of the great anti-abolitionists -abolition, in Rhode Island's history? I think he was. He, Moses Brown, and Samuel Hopkins. Um, Ray, this may be a question for you. I, I think it was misstated. Right. What did you say he was? Um, the question reads, wasn't Stephen Hopkins one of the great anti-abolitionists in Rhode Island's history? I think he was. The person is saying he, Moses Brown, and Samuel Hopkins. Okay, both of these men are the same. Right. Uh, <laughs> not the same men, but the same problem. Moses Brown is a, is, is a bad person a slaver, a slave owner, and then uh, after his marrying his second wife, becoming a Quaker, he changes his stripes. So 50 years of evil, and he lived to be 92, I believe, 40 years of being abolitionist, of being on the good side, positive in terms of slavery. But even that was mixed. He made money off of manumission work, uh, you know, freeing slaves, and he charged people for it. So he's very complex, very complex with a lot of evil under his belt. And then we made him, and I love this question, because we then made him the great abolitionist. And they don't talk about what he was before he changed. Now, Stephen Hopkins doesn't rise to that level. Stephen Hopkins owned slaves and a slave woman held his hand as he died. So he uh, says at some point that he's an abolitionist too. And if I give, uh, th this isn't a true assessment, but I'm gonna do it anyway. If I give Moses Brown say 33% on his improvement, I'd have to give Stephen Hopkins about a 10%. Uh, we're all complex people. We're not that complex, but these are not lifelong good human beings. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have time for questions. I knew we would probably run out. Uh, we had uh, four panelists who all had interesting things to say, and there's just no way uh, to cut this any shorter. Uh, so we really, not only the panelists, uh, but also the 
the wonderful audience who have um, uh, typed many things into the chat that I will I'll read and, and give some thought. I think we uh, have only touched the surface with some of these questions, but um, this was a really stimulating discussion tonight. Uh, and we thank you all. Um, uh, it was uh, presented by the friends of, of the Guanska um, Library, and I really appreciate their uh, support on this. Uh, and they're all part, you know, the larger Providence Community Library. Uh, and you can check our website for more programs, also to make a donation to us. Uh, we'll be sending uh, some links to other resources um, after um, the, the session is over, probably tomorrow or the next day. So thank you for coming tonight. And thank you to the panelists as well. Thank you. Good